Joseph Todorovich, welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. It's great to have you. So we've known each other a long time. We sort of uh, came up together, if you might say. Started out in the same gallery back in Laguna Beach. So, and that was what, 20 years ago? About? Wow. Could it be that long? Yeah. I, was that your first gallery? Yeah. Oh, was it not your first gallery? Mm. Well, I was working like with a local gallery in town, like kind of a, yeah. But, oh, yeah. I same mean, here. but that was, yeah, I would consider it like a first, you know, kind of like, you know, serious major gallery. gallery. Yeah. Same. Serious yeah. I did some little okay. things here in Salt Lake, but until I was, it went, um, yeah, nothing huge. So yeah, that was, uh, that was my first, uh, yeah, like you said, more serious gallery. So yeah, yeah, so obviously I know a lot about you, but um, I would like to know more about your history a little bit. So tell me a little bit about where you came from, how you ended up becoming an artist. Uh, well, I came from Southern California. I was born and raised here. Um, uh, I guess it all started when I was a kid. You know, I always enjoyed, you know, doing arts and crafts at my grandmother's house, my Nana. Okay. And in school as well, you know, coloring, you know, uh, anything that had to do with kind of creating the visual arts and uh, playing was just really fun. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, that, uh, I mean, there's, there's a few key experiences from like early childhood that I think kind of like got my competitive drive going towards like being better as an artist but then obviously you know throughout high school um and into college that was all i was going to do that's all i wanted to do so what that's are all I want. what is what is one of these experiences that got you more driven <laughs> it's funny i share it sometimes where uh you know i've had i like i like somebody did a craft or a, a project better than me and it like i kind of took it personal because like <laughs> You know, like, oh man, no, like, no, like that's, or, or I thought to myself, oh, that's really nice. That's a really great way to do things. Like, but dang, I can't do it the same way. So how do I, how do I get, how do I do it better? You know, things like that. And so, uh, I don't know, I guess it was kind of a healthy way. Well, I hope, I hope it was a healthy way to kind of, uh, grow as an artist being a little bit of competitive in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I won't call, I won't say any names or anything, but I Google this one, this one young man's name every once in a while to see if he's ever doing art and hasn't really popped up yet. So I'm assuming that, you know, I, I, uh, my persistence, you know, outlasted his persistence as an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a kid from, from what, your elementary school, high school? Yeah, fourth grade. Fourth grade. <laughs> Don't hold grudges much, do you? <laughs> uh, not typically. I don't do that. <laughs> so when did you decide, though, that you wanted to be a fine artist? I mean, because, you know, I don't know if you're anything like me or many of us where we don't even, we didn't, we knew we wanted to do something creative, but we didn't know what that meant. Was that your situation as well? Uh, Yeah, I guess like. In high school, I knew for sure I was like, that's all I wanted to do for a career. I wanted to pursue uh, the craft of drawing better. Like, I, I know I needed to learn how to draw more correctly. I was kind of into like, you know, making characters and doing graffiti and just like stylizing things and like making imagery a lot. Like, I, I really, really enjoyed it and spending a lot of time doing it. Like, and so, uh, you know, I knew I, w I needed to kind of like pursue the the knowledge or the history of drawing. And so in college, I figured that's where I was going to get that introduction. And, and sure enough, I did, uh, thankfully. And so I think it was in college when I kind of got introduced to figure drawing and the, the kind of the studio and the idea of drawing from life where I felt like, oh, goodness, like this is really tough and this pursuit is going to take a while. And so I was just all in. I just kind of emptied my cup and just wanted to start from scratch and get as much, as many tools as I, I could possibly get. And then I felt I, I would be a little more justified, you know, making my imagery in a way, or at least feel that I was, uh, you know, doing it more correctly or something. 
that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, not correctly. That's that's a bad word. More informed. Yeah. Suited for the job. Right. Type of and where did you go to school? Uh, so I went to a high school in Rialto, California, at Eisenhower High School. I had a great teacher. Her name was uh, Mrs. Ritchie. She was amazing. Uh, she just let me do anything I wanted to and was really, really uh, supportive and, uh, you know, let me, like, do projects outside of what we were doing. I, I, you know, I never really mentioned her, but, like, that's where it really started because, like, she was so, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. You know, you don't have to do it like I'm assigning it. That's just for people who don't really, you know, if you go for it, you know. And so that was a, that was a big influence. And then uh, from there, the closest place I could find uh, was a, a college, you know, near my city was Cal State Fullerton. It was okay. Cal State University. And uh, I figured, hey, they have a great art program or from what I knew. Um, and I could learn something about drawing there. Well, were you correct? Was it a great art program? Uh, yes and no. Uh, it, uh, when I started taking the drawing and painting courses, there wasn't a whole lot of instruction. You know, that's that old story of like, you know, they weren't teaching how to paint fundamentally, you know, like, like the 19th century painters or the old masters. They were just, it was a lot of expressive type of uh, inclination to the painting. However, in the animation studios, uh, I would wander the halls and see these really good figure drawings. And I, I stopped right away and I, I just recognized there was a, a three-dimensional language there that I didn't speak. And so uh, it just stopped me in my tracks. I said, this is what I'm looking for here. And so uh, I just like had to get into these classes. And so I, I waited and waited and just uh, like uh, during registration and talked to this instructor. And unfortunately I didn't get in that class. I got stuck in someone else's class, which was a real bummer, but um, it turned out to be the best experience in my, in my entire life. That's where I learned and was introduced to the concept of draftsmanship by uh, Marshall Vandruff, a great friend of mine. But this was an animation program, though, it sounds like. Yeah, so it was uh, a, a animation. Or, and there was a new one that opened up called Entertainment Design, uh, you know, kind of industry uh, bait or industry focused uh, instruction towards animation and, and illustration and so forth. Even the illustration wasn't really as heavy on uh, traditional drawing as the animation. And like, you know, like they would say, if you want to animate, you got to be able to kind of like draw a cylinder and create an arc and swing that cylinder consistently along that arc. You know, that's, that's it being, that's understanding volume and being able to manipulate volume in a, a credible way. And so, to, you know, the animators really knew how, needed to know how to do that. And it was really fundamental too. simple, simple forms. And, and so that got me, that just like got me hooked because three dimensionality was what I was looking for uh, in high school in order to kind of sure up my drawing. Hmm. So yeah, I found, I found a lot of good instruction in that. And, and when I say that, you know, we're talking good old fashioned figure drawing. It always went back to figure construction, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, okay, so then how did you shift from that mindset to, to fine art and to painting? That's the thing. So when I graduated, I, was, uh, I thought I was a pretty good animator. I mean, I was pretty good, and uh, I thought, but I mean, I had very little. Wait, you know, just you to don't... be clear, though, did you graduate in animation? Is that uh, your degree? I graduated an entertainment art degree. Really? I didn't yeah. know that. Okay. Yeah. I've never really used it for anything, but you know, those classes were useful. And, and from there, that program introduced me to some of the ateliers in Southern California. So I networked from there and was taking schools at ateliers and learning how to draw, construct a figure with guys like uh, Glenn Vilpu and Carl Ganas, who uh, I consider, you know, really, really, you know, uh, integral in, into my introduction to drawing. And they are animator teachers and construction oriented teachers. But then all, all of a sudden I start seeing these kind of like Riley drawings floating around this, like this kind of like uh Glenn Orbick, uh, uh, drawings in the Watts Atelier stuff and, uh, and in the, the tonal element and that tonal language of turning form and design, the very design heavy quick sketches started to, uh, 
kind of like uh, appear. And I was like, whoa, what? there's another language that I, I need to kind of understand. And so uh, that's when the shift began because that was drawing geared towards painting and illustration, not just linear construction, which is geared towards animation, right? So uh, what happened was great because I started to notice like all the Riley kids over here were, were very uh, kind of graphic and designy. And then all the animators over here were very, very linear and uh, construction. I try to try to put them together. And uh, now is what you basically, what, what, what I consider everyone is doing, which is starting with some scaffolding, lighting that scaffolding, and then designing that, that uh, you know, that uh, uh, illusion of uh, uh, light logic, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I felt like I was kind of like on my own trying to put it all together. Really? Back so then. So when you went from animation to drawing, well, not to drawing, but to painting and, and quote unquote, fine art. Um, that was just your own exploration, your own personal training. Yeah. So what happened was I, I started to figure out the Riley method a little bit in terms of like values, like shadow mapping, turning the form with that along that terminator edge, you know, getting yeah. that, that tonal drawing starting to work in five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute poses. And then even longer got into the longer, uh, you know, uh, one hour, three hour drawings. And I started to realize and be introduced to, well, I, then at the same time or right around the same time, I found out about the California art Institute where Glenn Orbick was teaching and saw the, the students and some of the instructors painting there. And, and they were amazing. And that's when I realized like, Oh my gosh, like they're actually doing, they're actually painting like Sargent, you know, hmm. and so with the, with that naturalistic color and, uh, and those, you know, that, that, that sense of illusion, that sense of truth, you know? Yeah. And then, so that's when the, the shift began. It's like, okay, somebody can actually teach me how to, how to paint in color in a naturalistic way, not just in this kind of like complimentary kind of like, uh, you know, if this is orange, this has to be blue. If this is purple, this has to be yellow type of idea. It was more of like, oh, these are, th this is the idea of controlling value, hue and chroma very sensitively. And they could, they could teach that there. And it kind of co co coincided with that Riley drawing, that tonal drawing that was so necessary, you know, to be able to kind of map out a painting. So this is when I realized, that, oh my gosh, I can actually paint, you know, I, that would have been like, my first start, but thankfully to me, I feel like grateful that I had to go through all these kind of drawing, uh, um, stages before I got to the painting because it, it felt, I felt a little more prepared. And then, um, you know, once I, once I was introduced to like a minimal palette and my teacher said, just now just do the best damn drawing you've ever done with this, with this paint, hmm. it, it, it all just kind of fell into place at that point. So what are you doing at the time, though? I mean, are you working a job? Uh, I mean, what's your life like when you're exploring this painting? Gosh, yeah, working a job for sure. Cleaning pools or delivering pizza or something along those lines. I, I had a, a, a little boy who was two years old and, you know, we were getting by and just I was just hustling, man, you know, just doing work. And uh, my son's mom was working a lot and we were just getting by. You know, hmm. and I was just pursuing this thing with like a, a vengeance, you know, I just loved it. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah and your son's like 22 or something now, right? Four. 24. Yeah. Cause see, I follow, you know, I've obviously I followed your work since day one and you paint, I remember you painting your son all the time and you could watch him grow in your paintings. It was a really cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. I wish yeah. I had some of those back. I bet I you I do. I bet. All of yeah, I bet. I remember when you were doing them thinking that I'm like, oh, how does he part with that? But you got to pay the bills, right? Yeah, you know, it, you know, it's all part of life. I got to be there in the in the flesh and watch him and mm -hmm. embrace him. So mm -hmm. That's always that's always what matters. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Okay, so did you actually attend this? Uh, uh, remind me the school's name again. The California Art Institute. Yeah, did you actually I... attend there then, or did you just do? Oh. Okay, and how yeah, for how I long did you do that? Uh, 
gosh, it, uh, it's gotta be like two years or so. I was, I, uh, I mean, the time frame it's so far, my memory is terrible, but, uh, it, it's, it was at least two years and I was studying with Ryan Wormser. Okay. Um, I dropped, I dropped in, I was able to drop in on a class with Glenn Orbick, which was amazing. Of course, it was just always so packed. And at that point I was like really interested in this, this color idea of how to, you know, how to, how to start painting. And mm -hmm. Ryan Worms was an amazing instructor. Uh, Jeremy Lipking would always, he would, he was there too. He wasn't teaching or anything, but, uh, they were all friends. And so he'd come into Ryan's class and paint pretty frequently, which was like, you know, huge, it's amazing. So, uh, I felt like we got dumped right into the right place and really got some great experience there. Yeah, I was going to ask about Jeremy and how you ended up becoming acquainted with him. So this is how, and and you guys developed a relationship. I'm assuming after that. Yeah, so it was a great group of people. I I saw his work in the magazine. That's when I realized that people were painting like nowadays, and I said, "Oh my gosh, this is in Los Angeles." I went to the show. That's where I actually met. Uh, um, it was at Morseburg Gallery way back in the day. That's where I met Ryan, and he he started. You know, we had. He, has, he had great paintings there as well. I had never seen his work. It was amazing. And uh, we had a great conversation. He said, yeah, I teach this stuff at this place. And that's how I got introduced to everybody there and started going there. The first person I ran into when I went to the school was Richard Morris, a very dear friend of mine and an amazing draftsman. Um, and uh, a lot of others, Michelle uh, Ignat and uh, um, Aaron Westerberg and Tony Pro and Greg Pro was teaching there as well. All these guys were Morgan uh, Weisling was an instructor there. Jeez and Louise! Just, it, it was just this amazing uh, school for illustration and 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 painting. And I guess it seemed like at the time, from what I can gather, that it was shifting. All the interest was shifting towards fine art painting. And so, uh, yeah, this like this. I mean, we just take these same classes over and over again. It's just like we developed this relationship and this group kind of traveled around. We went to kind of go see a retrospective with Richard Schmidt and we went to Paris and, you know, did all kind of stuff as a group to go see these uh, amazing exhibitions and just, you know, just in um, immerse ourselves in, in painting you know, and discussion as well. Yeah. I remember being in Utah and looking you know, toward California, you guys, and thinking like this is like a little 19th century Paris happening over there. You know, I mean, all of you guys all at once and you all became successful. Have you seen that happen again out of that school? I mean, obviously they're producing some artists here and there, but that was, that seemed like a unique time. No, that school is gone. Oh, that it's gone. No longer. So it, 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 it frequently gets um, mixed up with the, Cal Arts, or this one is California Art Institute. There's uh, California Institute of Art, mm -hmm. something like that. They share the same three words, but they're arranged different. Um, uh, so this was a small atelier in Westlake Village that was, they shared it with a small ballet school. Uh, oh. Really, I mean, it's really cool. Very small and just, just very uh, intimate. And then there's Cal Arts, which is like this large multi-campus, uh, I guess, in entertainment school. I'm not too familiar with what they right. do, but they get they get uh, mixed up a, a lot. But this school is, I believe, is shut down. Uh, oh. it, it started to kind of, you know, no one really cared for it. And the owner, the longtime owner, Buddy, his name was Buddy. He was a great guy. You know, he was just kind of... Uh, I don't know, just kind of rolling it till the wheels fell off. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Well, he produced some powerhouses in the meantime. I mean, holy cow. It's yeah, amazing. It was, it's a great place. Well, you know, I heard a story. So we, I mentioned earlier that you and I sort of, uh, I feel like, maybe you see it differently, but I feel like we sort of came up together because we showed up around the same time it went gallery and we're about the same age and everything. But I remember... Um, the owner of Went Gallery told me a story once, and I want you to confirm or deny this story. So he said that this young kid, meaning you, came in once 
with a painting under his arm, wanting to show in that gallery and that he just rolled his eyes because he would tell me that he'd get 300 applicants a week at, at least. And he says, he's just like, oh, here's another punk kid who thinks he can paint. I got to get rid of this kid. And then on your way out, you turn the painting around and he almost died. And then he <laughs> took you on immediately. And, and that was the beginning of that relationship with that gallery. Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, it sound, I mean, that sounds like something the way he would tell it. But, <laughs> How would you tell it? Well, yeah, so uh, it was, yeah, so I mean, he, we went there to visit the gallery because it was great. It was great work there. Uh, Ryan showed his work there, you know, from what we understood, it was like one of the, the top selling galleries at the time. And so, you know, he had a very uh, confident demeanor and, and said about how great the gallery was and everything. And we went as a group and uh, I said, yeah, I, I plan to show here someday, you know? And he, and he you know, just put a smile, you know, kind of a, a tongue in cheek. And he said, well, you know, that's the way, you know, step up, you know, that's the way you gotta do it. You know, you gotta, you better believe in your work if you're gonna do it, you know? And so one day, uh, I guess it was months after that, uh, you know, I was at a, a fork in the road, I was gonna, like I needed to do something because, you know, I've got a two year old and, you know, I'm, I'm struggling. Right. So, uh, I was like trying to get this UPS job. I got that. I ended up getting this UPS job actually, but, but that, that's later. But anyway, I was just struggling. I said, I said, you know what? Like he said, step, step it up or step up or whatever. Was he I implying said, that you need to like start low and work to him, work up to him? Yeah. He was implying like, well, step up. Like, what are you, what are you doing? Oh, like, what's, okay. You know, like if, if, you know, if you're, you're going to talk, talk, you better have the paintings. Right. So one day I just felt like I got like five of my best paintings together and I just drove down there and I just, I didn't know how you enter a gallery. I, you got to see the work somehow. Right. So I just drove down there. There was no one in there. And I was like, yeah, I'm here. You told me to step up. So I'm here to show you my work. You know. <laughs> And he goes, oh, you know, it's like, you know, I, like you said, like, he's like, I got hundreds of people trying to get in here uh, and so forth. Like, what do you, you don't just come down in here. You don't just do it like that. So, okay, I apologize. I didn't, I don't know. You know, you, t I thought you were, that was an invite, you know, or whatever. And so I said, okay, well, thank you for your time. And I was leaving. And then he's like, okay, well, well let me see what you got. And then that's when, that's when I, I showed him the work. And I said, I got a few more too. And he's like, okay, bring them in. And so he starts going over the work and he's like, okay, yeah, we've got a small or, or a, uh, a, a, like a young artist show and we want you to be in the show. And so from there, we kind of developed our relationship and yeah. I'm showing up of course he that. played it all cool. <laughs> he, he did? Yeah. Well, that's the way it sounds for him. Yeah. I, I can imagine him playing it all cool. But when he told me he was like, he said he fell, almost fell over backwards and he's like, I got to get this guy. Yeah, well, I mean, it was kind of a the visual language that we were speaking over there, you know, was kind of fresh at the time. I mean, you know, it's just decent edges, decent natural color, good values, kind of cool, you know, stuff like that. Like, yeah. And uh, it, I guess it had a unique look to it. And he, he recognized that it was, you know, had some of that going on. So he, he was he was with it. He he was all about making that money. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. So let's look at a little bit of your work right now. I'm going to pull up the, your website. Uh -oh. oh boy. <laughs> so we got 2020 paintings here and I tried to get in to your archive, but it's not working. So we'll just look at 2020 and 19. Yeah. Shoot. I wish we could have got into my archives. No, it's, it's all right. Um, and these, of course, they're gorgeous, unbelievable stuff. So. Things. I'm just going to pick a couple and, and maybe you could just, you know, give me the title when you painted it, tell me something about it, what inspired it. So this one, yeah. 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 The, this whole series came from just kind of just this, uh, um, uh, this retreat from color. Mm -hmm. I felt like, you know, the, the show I had before this was, it was just too, too much color too much going on the values and the 
but I, I just felt like I was getting overwhelmed. And I said, you know, I just have to go back to like getting be better, better designs and values, just graphic values. Right. And so they weren't meant to have any color at all. They, they were just meant to kind of go back to basics and try to connect values and create a little bit stronger impact. And so this whole series kind of came out of that. I just started painting in like raw umber and white and black, you know? And really? then I was like, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, just go, let's just go monochrome and just like slow down, take, take a step back and just make a nice, elegant, you know, design, you know, and uh, start, you know, explore that. And so this whole series came out of that. And then I started tinting them a little bit and, and then, you know, then it got a little more complicated and they just became this kind of monochrome series. And, and this is one of the figures from that series that, uh, you know, I thought was fun. It's kind of has that thinker pose that Rodin type yeah. of idea. And, uh, so, so you, yeah, this... you must be using red in here though, right? Yeah, so I started, yeah, so I'd come back and glaze and scumble and then do a little bit of direct painting back into these as I started to get, get my feet sturdy with the design. Mm -hmm. Felt like, okay, that's successful. Let me just tint it and, and make, and just kind of add just a little bit of pepper, a little bit of, just a little bit of salt, you know, mm. cayenne, and that's it. And just a touch though, not overdo it with the color, just to kind of tint them. And I wanted them to kind of stay kind of neutral as, as heck. Just because they have this kind of beigey quality that was kind of fun, mm -hmm. and again, it just like it was a way to escape color for a while. Yeah, you're making Zorin seem like a wild man with that palette right there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's just a return to drawing. I yeah. think you know, it all, drawing never goes out of style. No, you know, and I, drawing. it's gorgeous. I mean, tonalism has always been. I mean, it's a beautiful thing to simplify down to just value and design. Yeah. So yeah. really you're working with maybe three, four colors max here. Yeah, okay. definitely. Raw, um, raw umber, a mix, probably, I think I used a, uh, yeah, raw umber, ivory black, and then, you know, some flesh tones, like some, some ochres and some alizarin. I started using rose matter, which I really loved. And, uh, but then I, I heard it was kind of fugitive, so I had to step away from it. But it's like my favorite. It's like such a beautiful oh, color. Oh, that's a bummer. I didn't know that either. I don't use it, though, but that it's sucks when so you find good. out that about a color you love. Oh, my God. It's just so, that's just the story of my life. Like, you know, like, oh, it's like my favorite. I just immediately, um, like, it just, I resonated with that. And then all of a sudden, it just, I heard that. And I was like, mm. Mm. probably I stopped using it, you know. So you have two of these. Tell me about these two. Uh, so, so I only have one up, obviously, approach. But I'll, the next one, the other one's next in line, correct? Yeah, uh, probably. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I like, I like drawing bikes. Uh, I used to work at Aaron Brothers doing framing, and like I never forget, somebody brought in this bicycle drawing, and it was just so technical. And I was like, man, that just looks like a tedious amount of work, you know. It was like a profile view of this drawing, but the chain and the chain link and everything about it was just so, I was just so impressed with the, the dedication to that drawing. And I mean, I grew up riding bikes in the BMX era and like, I just, man, I absolutely, I was just a bike fanatic as a kid. And mm. so like, I have this, 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 uh, affinity. I don't, I haven't ridden bike, my bike in years, unfortunately, but uh, I just, I just feel so connected. So I was like, I can paint people with bikes. I love this, right? It's a good, it's a natural fit. So I started doing these and I just thought that they were really fun. Um, this is a place in Chino Hills that I like to paint at. And it's, you know, it's got that kind of landscape quality to it. It's really local. And, uh, I just started playing with this series a little bit. Um, yeah, just made these paintings with the, uh, the same model, Jade, she's great. Oh, so let me go back because we can't. So it do, it's not the next one. Let's see. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, so you have two of the first one and two of the second one. Okay. Yeah. Let's look at that. Now, that's a great thing. You know, I was talking to Adrian Stein yesterday about, she was talking about, oh, I don't know if I should do 
multiples of the same subject, da, 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 da. you know, we, we had a discussion about that. And, you know, I think it's a great thing. You might as well get mileage out of it, right? <laughs> so, so yeah. this is that thing, like, you don't want it to look like it came from the same photo shoot, right? Yeah. You know? Well, I, I don't know. Forget. Well, that's, that was, that's my thinking. I was like, oh man, can I paint this painting more than once? Because like, then it'll be obvious it was like from a photo reference. Well, I'm, I, I don't, I work from photo reference all the time. I work from life all the time. So I feel, you know, like, okay, everyone uses references. I don't know why it's this weird thing. They've been doing this for like centuries, right? It, at least a century. Anyway, anyhow, I thought that there was so many, so much good material out of these images that I wanted to explore them for a bit. You know, I've did a, I've did a handful of, of these and I just love the different psychological quality of the, just a subtle difference in the pose. And so I was just like, you know, hey, I, I don't care who, what, you know, I just want to make a painting, you know. So I've got a couple and then they just uh, started to kind of look like a series. And um, I was like, I thought that was amazing. Yeah. And how many it. of these did you do? This, this series right here, I, I must have done about five of these. Some of them were smaller. I did a, a drawing or two, so maybe even more. I'm not really sure. But wow. Some are five to ten of these and uh, I, from this moment here. And it's 24 by 24, so these aren't small paintings. Yeah. Well, they're not huge. They're not they're, huge you know, either, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Be the flesh tones are just unbelievably lifelike. That's one of the things I've always loved about your work is how lifelike your your flesh tones are. Very Thanks, very simple and understated and yet just rich and convincing. Yeah, I love you're, it. You're kind. Thank you for, for coming from you who oh, I obviously nice of you. You're my hero. Oh, I don't know <laughs> about that, man. That's I mean, nice of you to say. Like, I, I was like, I've got so many questions for Jeff in this thing. I'm like, I hope I get a chance to interview you at some <laughs> yeah, point. I don't know. Well, you know, it's funny uh, you should say that because when we, do you remember when we went to the, uh, what was that, Philly, in Philly? Uh, the U.S. The Armory show. show. The U.S. Armory yeah. Show. Yeah. Was that also your first big international kind of yeah. show like that? Yeah. And I remember yeah, meeting I you the first time, dude, I was so intimidated. I'm still intimidated by you. You're such a rock star, man. But that day we had lunch together and I'm like, this guy's like so freaking good. He's so good. That's funny. That's yeah. Hilarious. Oh man. You know, it's good though. I mean, one of the, one, one of the nice things about this podcast is just being able to meet your heroes and people you respect so much. Yeah. And I've always, I've always felt that way with you. Dude, um, you're, the feeling is ri ridiculously mutual and inversed. I like, appreciate I, that. I, I'll never forget when you when you were bringing those paintings in those uh, you were doing those kind of retro looking paintings. Uh, I was just like, damn, this guy can draw, man. Like this guy is the truth, man. Oh, thanks, man. It was appreciate so it. So well drawn and so thorough, and I'm just like, wow, this Jeff, this guy is like killing me here. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, tell yeah. So here's another one with a bike. Well, another gorgeous painting. Tell me, how do you choose your models? This is my niece, Ryan. Okay. She's awesome. She's just like, she's like one of my favorite people of all time to paint. She's got this fairy face and like, from like, since she was like, I don't know, three or four years old, she just looked like this little like fairy, you know, right out of some Disney movie. And, uh, and she's just, she's just got that look, man. She's awesome. And she's like, so she's a dancer and she's so like uh creative in her own right. So uh, she's just all about it. Like, yeah, like, like for sure. Like, you know, let's, you know, let's uh, do a photo shoot and make paintings. I was like, let's, you know, so she's just like a natural at it. And uh, she just got a really cool look, you know, man. Yeah. How nice is that to have it in your family, have someone in your family, you can paint over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And now she's like grown up, man. She's like, like, gosh, she's got to be almost 20 now. So, you know, they're like, uh, not that interesting anymore. Uncle Joey, like, you know, go <laughs> Oh, she won't let you do it anymore. <laughs> no, no, she will. She will. They just, they live pretty far now. You oh, know what bummer. I mean? but, yeah. Yeah. So, Cause you, you know, know, you get a good model and then they move away or they just lose interest. It's like, no, <laughs> I, I, I 
I've come to realize that's just the cycle. Like they it go is. through cycles same as we do, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's natural. That's all part of it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Oh, this is gorgeous. Oh no, go to the next one. You don't like this one. I, I don't have a great affinity for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I just said, it's gorgeous. I love it. But how about this one? How do you feel about this one? I, 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 I like this painting. This is my son's wife. Her name is Madison. We call her Maddie, uh, and she's awesome. And uh, this this painting is actually going to be in the uh, gold medal show. I entered it in the gold medal show for the California Art Club. I haven't been in it in a while. It's like, man, I gotta I gotta get my work into something. So I uh, I entered it in that show. I'm excited to share it for once, like in person. Like none of these paintings have been seen in person, except maybe by students or whatever, because of the COVID thing. Uh, actually, this show got kind of canceled because of COVID. Um, which was kind of a bummer. Yeah, you know? no kidding. I um, mean, canceled the, the in-person way. Right. Wait, so sense. how is it showing? It just online? Uh, yeah, it, well, now it's it's down. It's over. It's I'm, I'm moving on to other things. I'm like, mm. it's just in the past. Do you do that? Like after a paint, I, oh, after, yeah. after a painting served its purpose, it's just like on to the next thing. And this, this goes <laughs> oh, right, yeah. in the, right yeah. in the file. And then so, you're, and then you're like, okay, now I'm going to paint a masterpiece. And then, exactly, that's what and then you feel like I'm. you do paint masterpiece, but then you feel like you don't. So then you're like, well, this time I'm going to paint a masterpiece. Well, this time God, I'm going to paint a masterpiece. <laughs> I'm just chasing that feeling, man. Like, I, <laughs> I'm in hibernation right now. Like I've actually haven't painted anything worth a damn in like, uh, over a year. So, but that's okay. I've done a lot. I've been, you know, painting, uh, just doing demos and, and, culminating i'm just slowly brewing this this brew and i'm i'm in hibernation and but i've got something cooking and so i'm excited oh to man kind of you know how good that is to hear because i'm in the same boat like and it's nice to hear that other artists go through that where you just need some time i mean i'm assuming you're doing this voluntarily and not being forced to stop painting but of course yeah uh, of course and like i look everyone in my life knows like when it's time to get down it's time to get down like all everybody step away step aside like um it is time to go to work but yeah like i i i've been teaching a lot so i'm i'm uh i'm currently like well now i'm full-time faculty at laguna college of art and design mm -hmm. and so that's that's i mean i've been teaching there for 13 years or whatever but uh so it's kind of a i'm taking a, a new responsibility uh at, in really kind of dedicating a lot of a lot of time to that uh in the last year or so so uh that's great and i love doing it so it's fantastic and um it's just another craft in my opinion but mm -hmm. uh, but so as as the dust settles from all of that and it's like you know everything falls into line i'm like constantly there's something brewing you know that that feeling is just like oh boy you know i gotta get back to that easel and and say something you know yeah, and, and uh, it, it sometimes it feels like you need the time away to to get that drive built up to a point where it just wants to pop. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. You know, I mean, I see you. You do a lot of other projects, right? Like, oh. you're a craftsman. You like to build. You like to, you know, you've got stuff to do around the studio. You do leather work. You're making sketchbook is e easels, yeah. all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah, I don't know what. I'm, it's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, um, man. I, I, you know, I've uh, heard stories about Da Vinci and how Da Vinci never finished anything because he was always distracted. I yeah. totally relate to that. I just have too many interests, you know, and yeah, eventually like, I finish my work, but um, I just, to me, my drive is creativity and painting yeah. is just one, one way to express it. So I'm happy building things. I'm happy engineering things. I'm happy a lot of different ways as long as i'm being creative so absolutely yeah but but i mean but i get what you're saying though because i feel similar to you in that like sometimes you just have to be away from painting for a while and then you realize man i need this i need that drug like i need that fix and then it and then it comes back with a vengeance in a way isn't isn't that the beauty of it too i mean for ever since i can ever remember like it's always there for me it's just always been there for me. And it's just like, you know, it's like a, I don't know. It's, it's like a really nurturing relative. You know what I mean? I just love that. And, uh, and you know, 
it, that's that's life you know things have to kind of cycle around and and uh you know that's just that especially as as you know i think now i think in terms of decades right like before i was thinking like i've got to be i've got to paint like i i don't have time you know i got to now it's like okay this what am i going to do with this decade of my life you know what i mean and kind of like <laughs> strange but it's true and like painting is just this constant beautiful companion and uh you know in and the evolution of it is what I what I enjoy looking forward to it now. It's like, now what can I do? You know, all these years I just feel like I've been kind of trying to learn how to do it, and now it's like, how do I dance with it? You know, yeah. And, uh, so, so this one here compared to the last five or so has a lot of color. Talk to me about that. Yeah, this one had to be done in color. You know, like you do a few that. Yeah, you know, I mean, it would the same thing. It's cyclical, right? You got to do enough gray paintings. You got to get back to color. And this one, I, I wanted those flesh tones to kind of sing against that, that's that, that backdrop. So I just got back to it and say, can I still, do I still know how to paint in color? Did I forget, <laughs> you know, did I forget how to do this, you know? So this one, I was like, let's try this one in color. It had a beautiful harmony just in general that with all the kind of browns and the warm, <clears throat> all that warm, side of the spectrum and so uh yeah i just kind of just chose to get back to it yeah it still has though like you've always had as long as i've known you and your work it still has that beautiful tonalist quality that you're so good at though even though you've got this pop of blue in the sky and some violet shadows and some really rich really rich ochres and stuff it still feels tonal which mm. yeah so, which is beautiful well, so this term tonalism like this is a whole movement like like would, would we say like Ch child hassam is a tonalist painter i mean what i'm trying to understand this idea because i don't i don't really know i like well if you don't I know it i don't know it but here's what i understand it to be so to me it i feel like there are artists that and you've you've kind of defined it there are artists that are more interested in describing form and value, and there are artists that are more focused on color. And and so, like I like I'd mentioned before yesterday, I interviewed uh, Adrian Stein, and she has color oh, yeah. like I have never seen, and she can manage it like a, like no one I've ever seen. But her focus is color. She would tell you that she's like, I love color the more the better and um and so to me a tonalist isn't about color they're about describing form and creating mood okay okay this i can understand and thank you because that helps me a lot actually oh <laughs> does it i don't know if i'm right i just that's just how i define it my i, I, I don't care if you're right that <laughs> actually helps me a lot because mood is the thing for me and sometimes like when i like i mood is Color can be a part of that, that of course. recipe, I'm sure. of course. Yeah. but like value and, and, uh, and tonal relationships, I, I believe do really have a, a high place on the totem pole and setting the mood in a painting. If that makes sense. Right. Exactly. Yeah. To me, it's, so I've known tonalists that have color, quite a bit of color. In my opinion, they're tonalists because it's not their priority. To me, it's about priority. Well, would Seurat or Monet be a tonalist painter in their oh, colors? I don't think so. No, I mean I don't think any impressionist could be considered tonalist. But oh, okay, okay, yeah. See, that's why I don't know. Because I don't know I'm either. I don't know. Value, like some of those haystack value ranges are so minimal in value and form that the, the gentle nature of the tonal relationship seemed like one of the priorities in those paintings, along with the color. Yeah, so, and that's what I mean, is that they're not interested in form. They're interested in impression described through color relationship. I see. So another artist would have looked for ways to describe form through value, and they're describing it through color. You know, so, you know, that's, why I, that's how I would define it. Uh, um, oh. but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very ignorant artist. I know what I know and <laughs> that's about it. I know how to do what I know how to do me fairly I, average. I, 
Uh, yeah, I hear that's dude. I feel the same. Like I hear some so many like people talk about art, and they sound so intelligent. They're so knowledgeable, and I'm just like, man, I am an idiot when it comes to art. But I do have like certain principles that I built on that I feel like maybe I can't. Well, I mean, it's it's harder to speak about them than it is to kind of create the painting and just do it. You know? Yeah. Uh, but I do value that a lot, and I'm always trying to kind of as an instructor, obviously, be able to articulate things in a clear way, of course, right? That's, that's critical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, I think we're in the same boat there. I'm not um, a very well read artist either. So let's see what you got next here. Okay, so we're back. So I want to go just briefly look at 2019. And I want to ask you some more general questions here. Let's see. I wish I could have seen some earlier paintings. I wanted to see some of your paintings from back in the early 2000s, but just to see the difference. Oh my gosh. So tell me if there's something you don't want to look at, but this painting jumps out at me. That's funny. I can't find that painting right now. What are you talking about? You can't find it. Know, I don't know the location of this painting. Like, oh, but I've, you did I've get been... paid for it. No, no, no. I don't, I don't think it's sold. It has not sold yet. What and so I'm like, it's, I think it's like, I've been talking with the gallery guy my, and I'm like, Bo, where's this painting at? And he's like, I was like, I don't think we have that one. And cause I needed another, you know, frame. And so I used the frame from this painting for another painting, one of those bicycle paintings, I think. And I'm like, where is that painting at? I've been looking for it. So I think, I think it's gotta be here somewhere. I've got, it's gotta be like, it's a, it's on an ACM uh, panel. So it's gotta be like, just stuck somewhere in between something else. I don't know. In your but studio, I've been you mean? I, I hope. Oh, well, if you hope. find it, you clearly don't need it. So let me know the discounted price you would sell it for. <laughs> <laughs> It's gorgeous. So here's why this one jumped out at me. Couple things. And the the figure has a has a very violet tone to her skin, which always is really attractive. I well, I'm gonna say to a painter. Maybe I sh maybe I shouldn't generalize, but most painters that I've talked to love that that beautiful creamy white skin to paint because it has this translucent quality to it. Um. But what's interesting about it is it's got this violet and then all your warms are in the background. And so it's reverse of what's logical as far as creating depth. And yet it's, and yet you've totally pulled it off. You've got the cool figure in the foreground, the warm background. Did you even realize so, you were doing that? No, uh, not at all. This is, <laughs> this, this is one of those Frankenstein paintings where really it started out with raw umber and white and just really? like, like, Raw umber, white, and then ivory black, right? These, it, those grays and lavenders are just ivory black and white, really, with a maybe a little bit of alizarin scumbled later. Oh, yeah, so there's got to be red in there, yeah. So if you look at the top half of the painting, mm -hmm. um, almost, okay, so now I remember. So the top half of the painting is ivory black and white, basically. Now, right at the horizon line, I put a little bit of this thing called a blue black. I think it's called, it's a Rublev color, just to, just to blew it up ever so slightly, but it's basically ivory black and white. And then you get down into those bushes there, that is raw umber, the Rembrandt's raw umber. I mean, it looks really green, but I might've greened it up a little bit with black, I don't know, black and ochre. Okay. Just trying as simple as possible to keep it with black ochre, just really, really minimal, but, but shift the temperature. Like, yeah, that looks blue. This looks green and earthy. And then the figure was done in raw umber for the warms and ivory black. Um, and then the down, down at the bottom, that was all just straight raw umber. And then I glazed red over it and then started painting more directly with the red impostos. And so at that point it started to turn towards color. Right. And I'm like, okay, it's getting away from me in terms of like the monochromatic nature. Let's just go with it. And so what wound up is what wound up. It just wound up looking very lavender because of all of the, the ivory black and white and the alizarin glazed in there to kind of warm it up a little bit. So it's kind of like a Frankenstein 
approach to just coloring this landscape, which was fun because if I'm thinking about painting a figure outdoors, it's got to be painted usually directly to get those natural relationships accurate. But this is more like a kind of a, uh, what, what do you call it, an indirect method to painting a landscape seemed kind of like a fun novel novel approach to it and this was just what resulted ultimately well yeah uh, and it, i think it worked out amazingly well and i guess she comes forward just because of the because she feels more chromatic and probably because of that lizard on top of it yeah maybe the the lighter but the, the the highest contrast is in there too the yeah. lightest lights darkest dark and she's placed right in the foreground and yeah so, yeah i love it yeah that's a gorgeous painting so is there one you'd really like to talk about on here this one is sort of reminiscent of your older work i think okay um it, yeah this is this one started out from life and then i finished all the hair and the, the kind of rapunzel idea from from a reference and it's just a figure study mm -hmm. you know it was same thing it's in, it's monochrome and uh god yeah i wish we I, I wish we had an older painting or two in there i think if you go back like this one called if you go back to uh this one right above it okay this one this is, sort of uh, reminds me of your older work as well yeah this one's a little bit more i mean it's still in that in that phase but it's still i mean this one has a little bit more of that kind of detail oriented stuff where i used to get really interested in the the interaction between the background and the figure where there's to be this kind of backdrop of texture and, um, uh, and I don't mean texture, literal, like paint texture necessarily, but just like visual texture mm -hmm. and then these calm, soothing flesh tones was this kind of motif, uh, juxt try to juxtapose, um, in the, in the past. And I really like that. And that's something that I actually plan to get back to, um, because, you know, the flesh tone is <clears throat> typically just really nuanced and subtle and delicate and graceful. And, like, you want to juxtapose that. I want to juxtapose that against something more textural and detail-oriented. And so you just get this kind of snappy separation, you know. And whatever that texture is back there up in terms of an object, it just doesn't matter. The mind kind of hopefully just figures something out to make it go back and separate itself from the subject or the figure. It does. You yeah. don't even, you only look at it as a complement to the figure. It, it doesn't need to be anything else. Exactly. Yeah. That's the exact, exact intention there. So this one reminds me of the painting you did that it was at the Armory show of the girl in the, in the like vintage clothing shop going through clothes. Do you remember that painting? Yeah, yeah, that, that was the one that, that, yeah, that was the big one that I sold there at that show that, you know. That was a great was painting. Cool. Yeah, and this is equally beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Um, so can you tell us, you, you mentioned that you've got big plans and you're getting excited about um, painting again. Can you tell us anything or is it all top secret? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not top secret. I mean, uh, yeah, I want to do some larger scale works. Uh, I, I want to see, I want to, you know, I want to open it up and see what I can do. And, but I don't, I don't just want to like start cramming all these figures in there. I want to be thoughtful. I want to be, I want to think like the old illustrators and I want to be thoughtful about the narrative. I want to be thoughtful about the placement and the space, the arrangement, all the psychology of the figures, multi-figure stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know about this. I got questions for you about this, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I want to do something and then I, I, you know, there's this thing inside me. It's, um, uh, this arrangement, this idea of the arrangement, you know, I can, the only metaphor I can think of is like Bugs Bunny, like telling the, the flutes what to do, the, the, the violins, what to do and the percussion, what to do and how that works in terms of like visual uh composition and um i'm craving something very 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 rich and until i can come up with an idea that is worthy of this type of time investment uh i'm just 
you know, hibernating. Yeah. But I think I found it. Uh, I think I know the direction I want to um, put my wagon onto, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so how big are yeah. we talking? You said you want to work bigger. Well, I you know I I'm not a, a monument painter. Uh, I don't paint too large. I mean, I'm thinking pretty pretty large. So a couple f like five feet by something by twelve feet, maybe something like that. That's pretty big. I mean, that's really <laughs> that's for really me. Big. That's really really big. But I want to build up to that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of maybe start three feet by seven feet or something like that um, initially. And, uh, you know, do a couple of paintings. I feel like it's a, it's a kind of a smart idea to kind of learn from, you know, building up to something, especially if I'm going to do any, uh, large, numerous number of figures in, uh, in a painting. Yeah. It's so hard. I mean, painting multi, multi figures, some people are really good at it and just have a knack for it. And until you do it, I mean, I've done it a few times, um, some with s some minor victories and some with like huge failure. So, uh, I think I've just got to do more of it if it's something I, I think it, I want to pursue. Right. 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 Yeah. So tell me more about your teaching and how you teach and what your philosophy is. Uh, yeah. So I, I stick to fundamentals, you know, I, I, I teach fundamentals. And I like to teach tools. I don't like to influence style or even, or even, or, or even representationalism, hmm. you know, I, I don't, I think that that's generally what I teach is representational painting, but I think it's important to, um, at least at this day, day and age in our institution, we're trying to help students become artists, you know, not, you know, uh, anything else, you know, I'm in the drawing and painting program and some of these students have some really unique ideas that are, you know, very modern contemporary. And so I want to be there to help them understand how to paint the visual world as best as they can with, uh, uh, command and then step back and kind of prod their brains about what is it and why are they painting what they're painting? Sometimes, I mean, just trying, I mean, it's sad to say, yeah, I don't even know what I want to paint about, you know, and these youngsters are all about that. I mean, they're very, um, determined to, uh, say what they have to say. And I just want to give them the tools to do that. And I, I think it's, you know, it's an amazing time to be an artist right now. And there's so much going on and there's so much, uh, new developing visual language. So my approach is basically to help people paint and then to prod, why are they painting what they're painting and why are they using the kind of that, that technical narrative, uh, which, which narrative technically suits their, their ideas. And sometimes that can be, I think, uh, uh, semantical, but at the same time, it can be really visceral if somebody taps into something and it works. Does that make sense? Like, I think so. When the, when the abstraction or the, 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 the deviation from representationalism actually helps the paintings feel more real and mm -hmm. more truthful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, it's really powerful business right there. And, uh, it's an exciting place to explore, but you got to get away from, sometimes you got to get away from the idea of like, you know, what it actually looks like in, in, uh, in order to kind of evoke that visceral, um, response from the viewer, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, Maybe it'll help make sense if I ask you this question. You, uh, you mentioned earlier, one of your responsibilities is to help them become an artist. That's the most important thing. So maybe if you could define in your mind what that means to be an artist, it'll help me understand what you're saying about what your goal is in training them. Wow. Well, that's the thing. I think that's different for everybody. And, you know, mm -hmm. for one person, it might be, you know, I want to learn to paint and draw really well, 
uh, like an academician, right? And for that student, I adapt and I say, well, let's focus on, you know, anatomy. Let's focus on value, uh, hue and chroma. Let's focus on the visual objective qualities of this subject. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's easy because that, that's more objective. It's not easy, but it's more objective and you can start to send them down a path of, of, uh, of tailored exercises for them to develop those skills and to learn about anatomy and study and add to their, um, add to their, um, you know, toolbox, so to speak. And then, you know, there's other people who, who just, uh, they only need to represent the visual world to a certain degree in order to play, to play or work with the materials in a way that's more interesting. And so, um, in that way, representationalism is out the window. It doesn't really, it, it's not the priority for some people. And I'm talking about work that's really quite powerful, you know, like, um, I'm not going to say any names, but there's a lot of representational artists that border on abstraction. And we all know how important abstraction is to representational painting. I'm, sp- I'm speaking about the surface quality and the construction or deconstruction of the painting and the grappling with the image in order to kind of create patina yeah. or to create this, 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 uh, this um, surface quality that just can't be done in an ala prima session necessarily. I mean, well, you know, you're doing that here. In I'm trying. One, no, you are. I mean, that, that background is barely representational. It's very abstract. Right. I would argue anyway. Right. And, and I think that's the fascination about the whole thing is that people are so, especially younger people I, or, or, newer artists who who are just learning about all these things might get the idea that you're either in one camp or the other. And I think it's fun to have a variety of minds working together and and bouncing ideas off of each other and recognizing the the connectivity of painting uh, versus the the kind of difference in in, in it. You know, academic painting is so valuable to learn skill and to make beautiful paintings. But uh, so is abstraction. It's really important to play with your materials just for the sake of, of creating interesting surface quality. And that can be very, very valuable in a representational painting. And then these worlds collide. And that's where I think some of the most exciting work is coming out. And, and even in the past, some of the most exciting work has come out of. I mean, you go to the museum and you look at a, a Rembrandt and you cannot tell me that he was not deliberately concerned with the surface Mm -hmm. that construction of that surface i mean it was huge it was so important Uh, along with the uh um the lighting uh logic the sense of form and the sense of illumination in the painting all of those things really work hand in hand to create what he was doing as one just one example of great painting Mm -hmm. so uh you know the world has a lot to offer and, and I, i'm interested in seeing in just letting them kind of go full throttle and open it up opening it up and seeing what they put out there because then i learn from that quite honestly i'm learning a lot from these these uh these students they're they're amazing and they're getting better faster like honestly it's not even it seems like it's not even that hard to learn how to draw well or paint well anymore because there's so much information available right at your fingertips now and all you need to do is be practicing uh on a pretty consistent basis and you know the the clarity of instruction is out there right yeah. would you agree with that oh my gosh yeah i wish i i wish we were 20 years younger for that yeah. reason yeah absolutely uh but you know the mileage is a must you got to you can get the information but you got to put the work in they still have to do that and our mileage still counts so that's good Um, but you know, sometimes we need to step, I I need to step away and kind of look at, you know, other ideas and, and, and figure out where I, where I stand or where I want to plant my flag in this visual world that makes sense. And Mm -hmm. sometimes that's the hard part too, is you got to do that. You got to plant your flag somewhere and you got to own it and stand by it because you can't do everything, unfortunately, or you can't 
but it doesn't really work out. I, I don't know how well it works out when you start getting into too many different visual, uh, you know, uh, qualities mm -hmm. or, or visual, visual pathways. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage that? So you've got a class of how many in a particular class, maybe 20 it, students? No, no, no. T uh, 15 at the most. That's a large class. I mean, it's really hard to get individual, you know, attention, uh, 10 at 10 and under, or, or 10 is ideal. Okay. Uh, 15 at the max is what, what is what usually is happening. So are, can you, get are you forming a curriculum for each student based on their needs? Well, not, not, not necessarily because I'm teaching one course. I might be teaching advanced figure painting or intermediate portraiture, for example. So I'm not forming a curriculum. We have a whole foundations uh, curriculum that's, hope, that's setting them up uh, to get to that point. And so I'm leaning on that knowledge and that skill set and that experience and exposure to uh, help develop an individual curriculum as it pertains to por portrait painting. Mm -hmm. in my portrait class now you know portrait can you you take a look at like the bp portrait award or whatever and you can see it can portraiture as an entity can mean a lot of different things and i'm trying to kind of like open it up and say so what's portraiture mean to you how is how are you you know how is it a collaboration with the with the subject a collaboration um in terms of your interpretation of the person of the sitter and then, you know, a collaboration with the viewer who's going to be seeing this portrait. It really is this kind of experience that's multifaceted. And so I want to get them in that thinking of like, okay, how do I want to portray my subject? And just kind of open it up to them. Like, how do you, you know, one of Carlos Duran's really cool paintings that sticks with me is like this, like this young lady from like three quarter back view, which is the back of her neck and her hair. It's all red. It's in the, I think it's in the, National Gallery, but you know, it's just portraiture can just mean a lot. And so mm -hmm. in that way, it, it, it's uh, yes, we're going to do tailored exercises of painting directly and so forth. But I also try to kind of uh, evoke other ideas of portraiture and get them thinking about what it means to them in a very unique way and mm. hopefully balance that out in an effective way, you know, Inevitably, a lot of uh, a majority or at least half the students need to get back to basics, right? Don't we all? Yeah. But that's what I'm there for. And, you know, we can have those discussions and create tailored exercises to get them on track and stay on track with that. So it's a combination of balancing that exploration of, of ideas and this uh, uh, fundamental set of, of tools that's going to help them execute those ideas. So let me see if I understand this correctly. Um, so is what you're saying that you're teaching them fundament fundamentals, academic fundamentals, how to draw accurately, paint accurately, um, and basic principles of chroma, hue, saturation, whatever. I'm not, I already said that, uh, value and so on. Edge. Yeah, all that Edges stuff. and so on. Um, but, you're allowing them space to express themselves while still following the curriculum and executing yes. the assignments. So yes. you're not looking for a bunch of clones of Joseph Todorovic. You're looking for people to fulfill the assignment, but yet giving them room to be creative and explore other things. That's our goal at school for sure. Okay. You know, we, that's what I mean by we want, you know, we want to create individual artists, you know? Now, you know as well as I do how how long and how much dedication it takes to be a proficient painter, right? I mean, uh, but like I said, what I'm noticing is like, they're getting better faster. And I think that acknowledging that is a kind of a cool evolution in drawing and painting. I just think more people are, get it faster. It might be because they have a great teacher though, Joe, like seriously, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think that's occurred to you, but I'm going to put that we, out there. We have a great program and we teach fundamentals and we hit it hard and we, we do it, you know, we do it well. And, and, and I appreciate that. I, I like to think that, you know, 
when it's time to demo and get down to business, you know, I, that's what I'm here for. So mm -hmm. I want to ground, I want to be that grounded common denominator. And when you got to get back to the good old basics, like I said, drawing, good old drawing never goes out of style, right? Yeah. So when you got to get back to that and, and sure that up a little bit, we, you know, becoming aware of it on your own is really important. You go back and you start, you start practicing more and you start tailoring that. But I am noticing that, you know, the language of good old fashioned drawing and painting is just more common. And I want it to be kind of cultural around our school where it's just like, yeah, we get it. You know, hue, value, edge, obviously anatomy. Everyone's like, yeah, I need to take more anatomy and so forth. And, and so it's just, just this common understanding of, of what the basics are. And then that allows them, I think, to feel more confident in their exploration of new ideas and to feel like it's not entirely impossible to foster skills and ideas at the same time, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because one without the other is, one without the other is, I would argue is not artistry. I think a lot of great artists, like when they're young and like when I first got some important knowledge, I will ran with it. I was like, I gotta, I gotta run. And that's what they should be doing is, in my opinion, is getting these ideas and, you know, uh, in these tools, having some victories and some successes with these tools, and then going ambitious, being ambitious with those tools, because now they're going to learn how to solve unique problems with the tools they have and create these new visual idea, ideally speaking, create these new visual, uh, paintings that, you know, we've never seen before. Hmm. I mean, that's, that's my sappy idea of it. You know, no, like I agree with you 100%. You know, I, you said one without the other is not art. And so here's my definition of art. And I don't know, many people won't agree with this. Some will. But I think art is something that's made with good craftsmanship, a good idea, and good design. Absolutely. If you're missing one of those things, if it's only craftsmanship, you're a craftsman. If you're only a design, you've only got good design, you're a designer. And if you've only got a good idea, then, then you're a person with a good idea. That's it. <laughs> right? You have to have all three. And, and so I love that you said that um, because we know that we see in this world where we have ateliers popping up left and right, it's really easy to learn how to draw and just rely on drawing and, and not really and be tempted to not really flesh out what it is you have to say and flesh out design and concept right and and you know there's absolutely nothing wrong with with that like you can you can do that and get really really good at it and that's great you know but there there's a time a, a decade in our lives will come when we need a shift we need a change you know yeah we need something new and so yeah and i think you're absolutely right the, the thing the three things you just said you can basically take any painting look at it and say oh it's heavy on idea it's or it's heavy on design or it's heavy on on craftsmanship uh but there's no idea there or it's more heavy on idea and not heavy on craftsmanship and you can kind of you can kind of manipulate those those levels on any painting you look at i think it's a it's a it's this great kind of uh uh, analytical, um, way to, um, decode painting. Yeah. And they don't and, have to be equal by that definition. Of course. And, you know, to your point, there is nothing wrong with being a craftsman. That's a noble thing, right? Absolutely. So be a craftsman, right? I just think that, um, art is hard to have yeah. all three of those things is it's really hard for me to get all three of those things in every painting. Like it's really hard. And therein lies the pursuit of mastery mm -hmm. in my, in my opinion, it's only a pursuit to, it's only a thing to be pursued. You're right. I mean, in, in surely never bestowed upon oneself. Right. But the noble pursuit of mastery is one that I hold very dearly and, and very reverent towards. And, you know, and, you know, Dog on it. As long as I'm still kicking up, I'm going to pursue it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I just want to make, you know, the next one painting of mine that, that might hold up, you know, and I, that 
in life, I mean, that's enough for me. I love that idea. You know, if I get, if I'm able to, you know, figure out what makes it happen more frequently, then great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, this is a great conversation. You know, it's bringing up a lot of thoughts. One thing that comes to mind that I, I don't know if I've ever put this together before, but I'm, I believe that it's really important to learn craftsmanship in, in the same way a, po a poet should learn vocabulary, right? Like you got to learn to speak before you can choose what not to say or to say, right? But at the same time, once you know vocabulary, so to speak, or once you know craftsmanship, only once you know it, because it's so hard to get it, that almost becomes the easier part. And then it's like, oh man, now I got to figure out how to make beautiful paintings with this craftsmanship. I, it's like, oh, that's the hard, that, then it, then you realize just how hard it really is. Right. I, I just got chills, you know, like it's <laughs> such a good, it's such a good analogy. Poet, poetry is when I hear the words of a good poet describe a feeling, I am just so in awe because it's so difficult to use words in a way especially being a, vi a visual storyteller, it's so difficult to use words in an effective and an artistic way. You absolutely have to know vocabulary and structure in order to use them playfully in a way to be expressive, right? I mean, I, that's just a really good analogy. I love that. And I, it just gives, it sends chills up my spine to think about the arts or the thing that helps us do that, communicate mm -hmm. at that deeper level. And it is something that's really challenging and can, uh, and be a lifelong pursuit, you know? Yeah, it really is. So, all right. So we're about at the end of this conversation and it's been a great conversation, but I got one final question for you. If, um, you could give one piece of advice to aspiring artists, that you wish you had when you were starting out, what would that be? Um, only one, huh? No, you can give two, three. Uh, we, well, we can go over time. <laughs> I, I mean, um, you know, I think, you know, when I say one thing, it leads to the next. And, you know, ultimately, all of them kind of funnel in for me to this this notion of appreciation and gratitude, like, you know, just that it's almost a spiritual thing where just every breath is so, the older I get and I've got, you know, two young, beautiful daughters and like every breath is just so sacred to me. And the gratitude, if you're working from that place, then everything like the advice I was going to give about developing a good work ethic, you know, uh, you know, being organized, you know, learning a little bit about business, you know, all of those things kind of spring from that root of gratitude so that you're fostering this, this, this very special life journey that you have um, to do the thing that you love, which is, you know, make paintings if you're an aspiring artist. So, you know, it all goes back to, to that and just be thankful and you know work hard and stay stay focused and um i think that 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 can lead to some some true happiness at least from my experience so I'll, i guess i'll put it like that that's awesome that's great advice i really appreciate that and it's been a great conversation and a huge honor to have you on the podcast thanks joseph for being my guest yeah Jeff, the honor is all mine. I am such a fan of your work. Every time I see something come out, I'm just like in awe. Of <laughs> That's too nice, man. Appreciate it. The, the excellence of your work, man. Re seriously and truly. And one day I hope to pick and prod your brain about some specific things about <laughs> your work that I think can help me in mine. So thanks a lot. Until we, until we speak again, my good friend. All it's right. nice, nice talking with you again. Same to you. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends. And if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. 
Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.